Um, welcome to the uh, second of our uh, week of lectures and programs for Native American Studies Week 2021. Um, this is our first um, hybrid event with, we have folks here at the center, which is great to have people back in the building and um, folks watching from home or office or their cars or wherever they might be watching. Um, again, I wanna thank uh, Elizabeth Streeter for organizing this uh, series of events uh, and uh, Crystal Mountain for her help, Katie Shule, uh, um, uh, Ashley Lowermore, the, the whole staff uh, here at the Native American Study Center as well as the faculty. Um, tomorrow we have a uh, exhibit opening at two o'clock. We're standing in the gallery where uh, the reception for this exhibit will take place, but um, the folks here put together just a, a very informative and very uh, appealing, visually appealing uh, exhibit on Native American uh, technology and innovation. Um, so two o'clock tomorrow, we'll be uh, live streaming that as well, uh, sending it out through Zoom um, so that you can have that experience if you can't be here in person. Uh, and then on Thursday at 6 p.m., um, Alex Osborne, a Chicago photographer and artist, will be uh, discussing his work. It's on display here at the center as well. If you have a chance to come by and see it, it's it's wonderful. Uh, but again, we'll we'll live Zoom that and live uh, have that live on Facebook. Um, and then on Friday at noon, our lunch and learn for this month um, will be uh, focused on indigenous foodways, the Native American foodways. Uh, but today we're joined by Dr. Kim Richardson, uh, my colleague here at USC Lancaster. Uh, Dr. Richardson has been with USCL since 2008. He received his BA from Weber State University in Ogden, Utah his MA in Latin American history from the University of Texas at Austin, and his PhD in world history from Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. He currently teaches Latin American history, the history of Mexico, science and technology, and world history, and European history. So uh, please welcome, uh, both at home and here in the, uh, in the center, uh, Dr. Kim Richardson. Thank you, Dr. Criswell. Well, I'm excited to do, I forgot how much I love the Native American Studies Center. It's just really cool. You can get a feeling when you come in here. How exciting. Well, the last time, well, one time I gave a presentation and I, uh, uh, with this really famous historian, you know, and I was a little bit nervous because he was so famous. And afterwards, uh, I asked him if he had any advice. Him and his wife were both there. I said, do you have any advice for me? And he said, uh, yeah, don't talk so much. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try to follow his advice and not talk so much. But if you can see here in front of you, <clears throat> this is a uh, medicine among the Aztecs, which I'm really excited about. Uh, I found this uh, a fascinating topic. The very first time I took a, what was it called? Pre-conquest civilization class. Uh, we had to pick a topic that would be exciting that we hadn't heard of. And so I picked music among the Aztecs. I'm like, I'm gonna find out if they had music. And so, so then when uh, Elizabeth asked me if I wanted to speak, I thought, well, you know, it'd be interesting medicine among the Aztecs. I don't know a whole lot about medicine. So uh, I learned, I learned quite a bit. So uh, this is uh, medicine among the Aztecs right here. And I'd like to give an overview about the history of the Aztecs here uh, before I really get into it. Uh, so if you'll bear with me here, right here, the Aztecs, the name Aztecs came from where they came from. Uh, the very first 19th century term Aztecs uh, was probably not what they call themselves, but I'm going to use it anyway. They came from a place called Aztlan. Aztlan is probably somewhere in the American Southwest, the Uto Aztecan speakers, and they began to migrate probably around 1110 CE. So then they began to migrate south. And as they got down south, people would ask them, where are you from? And they'd say, I don't know. Well, who are your parents? Well, I don't know. So they called them the Chichimecas the lineage of dog people as they came down here. Well, they were following their god, Huitzilopochtli, and Huitzilopochtli was going to lead them to the promised land. Okay, so they're following their god, tribal god, going to the promised land. They finally get to the Valley of Mexico, which looked like this, big lake right in the middle. It's been since drained by the British in the 19th century, but it looked like this here. And uh, they uh, allied with a number of the uh, the uh, city-states on the edges of, uh, of uh, Lake Texcoco here, where they got into a number of uh, problems, especially because they were much more adept at human sacrifice than any of the other tribes were. So as they're following the tribal god, they were supposed to know when they reached the promised land, 
because they would see an eagle on top of a cactus with a snake in his beak. So the Ritran, this is from one of the uh, 16th century uh, paintings uh, done by the Aztecs. And you can see right down here, it says Tenochtitlan. Well, they got in trouble with the city state of Atzcapotzalco. So they were chased in the middle of the lake. And on the lake, there was a outcropping of rocks. And on this outcropping of rocks, they saw this symbol right here, a snake uh, in the beak of an eagle on top of cactus. And so that's where they began to plant there to, to uh, establish their, their city, their empire right here. Uh, again, this one here uh, and all of the images that I'm gonna show are really from the 1500s, the 16th century, after the conquest of the Aztec Empire here. I think I clicked the wrong direction. Okay, I'm clicking the wrong direction. You have to click the right direction. Oh, you click on the right side. That's what it is. You click on the right side. I knew that, right? So this is the flag of Mexico, as you can see here. And right in the middle of the flag, then you have that eagle with a snake in his beak. And then on top of the cactus here, uh, this is the promised land. Okay, so they began to build up an empire uh, right on the middle of the lake, right there. Uh, after Hernan Cortez came, then he wrote a whole bunch of letters to Emperor Charles V. And in those letters, he described what he saw. And so Charles V had them printed in the very first uh, uh, print of the city of Tenochtitlan. This one here is at the Library of Congress that I took a picture of with, uh, so you can kind of see the, 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 whatever you call that here. Uh, and so you can kind of see, it's not exactly like this. This is described uh, in a letter and then they printed it off. Later on, they're going to paint it and draw a really 16th century, beautiful painting of this uh, uh, Tenochtitlan, this Aztec uh, capital here. Okay, so these are the Aztecs. They began from here and they began to spread farther and farther. The more the city of Mexico, Mexico City uh, expands, the more we discover more about the Aztecs because they're digging up some of the old ruins and everything. And it's really exciting to learn about. Here's a 16th century painting. And this is describing uh, the Aztecs are going to encounter uh, Hernan Cortes. Hernan Cortes landed in 1519 in the coast of uh, Mexico in Veracruz. Uh, and then he's gonna start marching inland. This is an awesome painting because this one is at the Library of Congress as well. Uh, although I couldn't take a picture without the flash getting in the way or whatever you call it. So I downloaded this one from the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, but this is uh, uh, of the two different, the old world, the new world clashing together. It's one of my favorite paintings here of this here. Okay, so that's the background here. When Hernan Cortez landed then, he starts marching his way inland and people begin to die. And the whole point of this discussion today is I'd like to know more about the death of 95% of the Native Americans and whether or not it's true that they were living in virgin territory. They were living in without any diseases, uh, without any sicknesses, what was going on there? And that was my thesis, what I was looking for. So Hernan Cortez, that's uh, an image of him as he's coming. This is uh, his translator, uh, Malinche, uh, and it's gonna help him to uh, converse, of course, with the, the rulers and, and whatnot. Well, he came into the Valley of Mexico. He met, as you saw in that image, met with the emperor, the emperor was Moctezuma II. And Moctezuma said, basically, welcome to Tenochtitlan. My dad's dead. You can go and sleep in his palace. So he did for six months. Well, Hernan Cortez was uh, uh, not supposed to do what he did. He was not, uh, uh, he did not have permission from the crown to go and attack or even visit the Aztec Empire. So this guy right here, Panfalo Ginarvayas, you might know him because he later goes into Florida, uh, lands in Veracruz to arrest him. Everybody's excited. Maybe we can get rid of the, the Spaniards. So he goes and he leaves Pedro de Alvarado behind uh, and he goes to deal with Panfilo de Narvaez. Uh, and you see in this image here, this is what happens. Everything got out of control and uh, Pedro de Alvarado began to slaughter the Aztecs. Uh, feeling that they were going to uh, perform human sacrifice and perhaps they were going to attack the Spaniards. Not a very good idea. That made everybody mad. Nobody likes to be slaughtered. At least that's what I hear. 
here's an image of what then happens. Uh, Hernan Cortez comes back to the city of Mexico, which was Tenochtitlan. He sees everybody mad at him, so he decides he's better escape. The Aztecs were so upset with him that they began to throw rocks and stones and everything they could find at him. And five out of every six Spaniard died at this time. And that's called the Noche Triste, the sad night. Again, this is this image here, the 16th century painting can kind of show how, how, how violent and confusing it was as they sought to escape from Tenochtitlan. Well, here is, whoops, wrong one, but there's the right button. Here is the point. When Hernan Cortes came back from the coast after dealing with Panfilo Ginarvais, who he poked in the eyeball and put him in prison for two years, he uh, brought back an, uh, a slave with him, a black slave uh, that had been staying in a little city called Sempoala. And the Sempoalans had begun to die of uh, these little bumps all over their bodies. This is the beginning of smallpox that spread in the Americas. It had already spread in part from the, uh, in, in, on the islands where uh, the, the Caribbean, especially Hispaniola, but now they're spreading it into mainland area. This again is a, is a drawing of, uh, you can see how this person uh, is sick, this person is helping them, this person will die, right? Smallpox was really violent uh, uh, here. So smallpox, they also began to die pretty soon of measles, of influenza, of typhus, and lesser so diphtheria, malaria, mumps, pertussis, I can never say that word, tuberculosis, and yellow fever. The Native Americans, the indigenous peoples, began to die of these diseases. Why did they die so fast? Is it because they had no diseases? They had no sicknesses? That's what I was taught when I was an undergraduate uh, a century ago not quite that long, but a long time ago. But was it because they had no diseases? Well, this is from an As uh, a Maya book, and this was what it says. There was no sickness. They had no aching bones. They had no high fever. They had the no smallpox. They had the no burning chest. They had the no abdominal, abdominal, abdominal pains. They were abdominable too. They had then no consumption. They had then no headache. At a time, the course of humanity was orderly. The foreigners made it otherwise when they arrived here. They brought shameful things when they came. Well, is that true? Is it true, according to the Maya, uh, that there was no sickness, no headaches, no consumption, none of this stuff that we've been taught as undergraduates? Well, not really, not really, because we know by reading their own accounts that they had dysentery, viral influenza, pneumonia, roundworms, nutritional deficiencies, salmonella, tuberculosis, and epilepsy. In fact, the most recent uh, Smithsonian Magazine argued, uh, uh, well, I guess argued isn't the word, postulated that perhaps what led to the downfall of the Aztecs was salmonella. I don't think that it's quite um, viable, uh, probably not, it's not plausible, but it's something to think about. So why do they die so fast? Well, one thing they did not have, as you see here, plague, cholera, smallpox, typhus, or measles. These big things they did not have. Well, why didn't they? Why didn't they have these big things? What's going on? Well, Here's some great theories about why they didn't have the big diseases. Number one is called the Bering Strait. Well, it's not a, it's not called that. It's a, uh, the Bering Strait served as a cold filter. Just like every uh, winter you want a cold freeze to kill some of the bugs out there. Well, the theory is, is that the, uh, uh, the diseases froze and died off during this period. I'm not sure, you know, because the people that carried the diseases, they didn't die, they didn't freeze to death, but perhaps it was enough of a cold filter that they were able to uh, not have some of these big diseases. That is plausible. Another theory that could be the answer for why they uh, didn't have these diseases is because they didn't have domesticated animals. They had a few, uh, such as the, the dog, this hairless, squinkly dog, which is nice. I still remember my 
uh, undergraduate professor arguing that it made a good water bottle and a snack if you were really hungry. So anyway, but it's true. Jared Diamond argued 80% of big game animals became extinct by the end of the last ice age. So when that Bering Strait opened up and people walked to the Americas from Siberia to Alaska and on the way down, probably between 15 and 25,000 years ago, they had big game. And there's lots of evidence of the big game, but they've been killed off to extinction. So they are not going to have dense herds of the variety that spread diseases. They didn't have cows or pigs or sheep. Uh, those things spread diseases. And one of the reasons uh, is because they sleep inside your little hut with you to keep you warm and also you protect what's most expensive. Well, what about llamas? Well, first off, we're talking about the Aztecs and they didn't have any llamas or alpacas in the Central Valley of Mexico. But llamas uh, have smaller herds. And I don't know a whole lot about llamas, uh, except they wear pink pajamas. Just kidding. Maybe it's purple pajamas. But, uh, uh, and, but then you see them every once in a while. I never see big, big herds, but they have small herds and people don't drink their milk. Okay, and they always stay outdoors, which is a, probably a good thing that they don't come inside with you. Uh, and so because of this, they don't spread some of these diseases that would be spread otherwise here. So the first thing then, uh, let's see, there we go, uh, was simply that uh, the Bering Strait through that theory, then it killed off the diseases. And the second one is they don't have the domesticated animals as other groups do that would spread some of these diseases here. Recently, there's been a lot of look at the bubonic plague with uh, the pandemic here, and they've argued that much of the bubonic plague spread because of these, uh, these close proximity to animals and also the trade routes that began at this time. The third reason is crowd epidemics here. And I knew less about crowd epidemics until I started doing some research. And I'm like, oh, it makes sense that if one person gets sick and you're in a crowd then everybody gets sick, but there are certain diseases that don't really spread unless you have a crowd. Um, this, I took this measles from the uh, South De uh, Carolina DHEC website um, here uh, and diseases uh, need three, it says three to 400,000 peoples in close proximity for it to really spread here. Uh, smallpox, measles, plague, tuberculosis, the flu and the whooping cough, those are all crowd epidemics. And since uh, th there wasn't as many people in the Americas as in the old world, then therefore uh, it simply didn't spread as much. Now it's interesting because how many people live in the Americas here? Well, uh, I'm not sure. Probably about a hundred million people from North, all the way North America, all the way down to Tierra del Fuego, probably about a hundred million if you can guesstimate because nobody counted them until it was too late to count them. So they tried to guess uh, here. So how about just the Valley of Mexico or Tenochtitlan? That might be easier to find out how many people live there to find out if crowd epidemics could spread. Well, perhaps then 10 to 20 million people in the basin. Well, if it's 10 to 20 million people living in the basin there, it could spread, why not? In Tenochtitlan, that city, uh, probably not more than 250,000. That's the most recent guesstimate because since they built the city right on top of the water, so they've got pilings and they put the pilings on and then they built a house right up on the pilings, which oftentimes, led to flooding, wasn't very good, but then they'd have to start over again. Uh, you can't have that many people. Uh, what we do know is that by 1618, there's only 1.6 million. So there might've been 10 to 20, there was only 16, uh, 1 1.6 million in 1618, they died. It could have been, uh, well, it was because of these diseases uh, that for whatever reason did not spread. Bering Strait theory, um, the, the lack of domesticated animals, um, the crowd epidemics, and maybe because the trade routes, although there was trade routes, the Mississippi Valley traded with um, the Central Valley of Mexico, and they traded with the Inca uh, down in South America. They traded, but not to the extent. For example, before any European had ever gotten down to the Inca, the, all of a sudden people began to die of this new disease that nobody had heard of, smallpox here. 
Well, in other words, they died. Uh, and it's a demographic catastrophe, um, but they were not living in true virgin territory where there was no diseases, right? There was diseases and there was sicknesses. Uh, uh, this is what I found the most fascinating. Uh, the first one is uh, what causes sicknesses? Supernatural causes. If you take the Mesopotamia, uh, or if you take um, the Middle, uh, Middle Ages in Europe, there is the supernatural causes of diseases. You forgot to say your prayers or, or you were bewitched or something. Uh, in particular, there are spirits, supernatural spirits that have contact with the underworld. They usually can come up through anthills, through uh, caves, through crevices, and they connect the uh, underworld with the upper world. And these spirits often absorb your spirit, the animistic hot force within the people. By absorbing these, they would cause you to become sick in certain parts of your body. So you'd have to find out which you upset and which is the cause. So other animistic forces include the Teolia and the Eheyoto, sorry about my slaughtering. The first one though is the Tonali, uh, it's the temperament. Uh, it's associated with astrology. If you think about the, um, the humors in the Middle Ages, that is oftentimes associated with astrology. You could find out if you were going to live a life that had a depressed temperament or a, uh, anxiety-induced temperament or you were a hot-blooded temperament. Uh, but this tonali uh, determines things such as your occupation. It's located in your head uh, and it increases with age. The more, the older you get, the more you have this and the more you know your temperament, your destiny. We all know parents who are like, well, I'm too old to change. That's just the way I am. But it could decrease. You could have head problems uh, if you, uh, for example, drink way too much. And oftentimes among the Aztecs, then um, you could be punished with death if you uh, were drunk in public. Now, I don't know if it would be the first time, but excess drunkenness is frequently cited as a cause of putting someone to death. The second thing is oftentimes your heart. Your heart needs to be strong. Uh, the center of thought and personality, Teolia, is in your heart. It's the will, it's the memory, it's the emotion, it's your mental activity. Uh, remember that the, the, it was the, the students of Alexandria, the, the Hellenistic world, that decided that it was uh, your brain that was the center of the nervous system that they discovered. Well, in this case, it's your heart that has your memory, your emotion, your mental activity. So you have to take care of your heart. But some things could cause you to have a weak heart. I uh, hear. Uh, there's a goddess of sexual lust, Tlatzol Uh She was more than just that goddess. She had many other uh, purposes. But she would tempt people to carnal excess. That carnal excess would damage our heart here. So here is a great advice that was given to the youth. This is how you must act. Before you know woman, you must grow to be a complete man. And then you'll be ready for marriage. You will beget children of good stature, health, agile, and comely. You must have a strong heart by following certain precepts. But sometimes uh, for sexual infidelity or whatever, uh, you are going to have problems. But you could confess your sins. Again, this is going to be given to the priests that are going to write these down. So all of it has to be taken with a little bit of grain, a little grain, a little bit of grain, grains of salt in this. You confess to this goddess in the presence of a priest. That would cause your forgiveness through repentance, and then your heart could then seek to begin to uh, mend itself. Of course, that is because men have a fixed amount of semen and you have to wait till later in life or your, your, your heart will become weak. You know, older you get, the weaker your heart. And this is why, because it's associated uh, with your ability to procreate. And so you should wait in life. And that's uh, become super important. Sexual sins became a big deal amongst the Aztec, drunkenness and sexual sins. The third, uh, well, no, this is associated with the second. I almost forgot. Uh, women would give uh, birth, uh, but sometimes women would die. There's been a little bit of debate. How does one go to uh, 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 
a celestial paradise, a kingdom, a heaven, right? Well, one argument has always been that women, when they died, they could go to heaven. I uh, hear, well, it's a little bit more complex because of this teoli of women, uh, if they died in childbirth, would accompany the sun until sunset. Uh, they became this spirit here, Siwa Tateo, and they would return to earth on specific days and afflict humans who chance to meet them. So they would afflict humans, here's an image, with something like epilepsy. Epilepsy then became a big uh, danger. Uh, there's not a whole lot of ways to avoid epilepsy, except you want to avoid the women that died in childbirth that would come back, which was not a really good idea here. Okay, so those are the spirits. How about the third one? The third one is located in the liver, liver failure, liver disease. Uh, of course, you can see how this would be associated oftentimes uh, with uh, drunkenness, but it is a little bit more complex because the liver gives humans vigor, passions, and feelings such as desire, envy, anger. You want to have a clean liver. Clean liver equals health. If you are immoral, not living virtuous, then your liver would become dirty, and um, that's not good. I uh, hear that could lead to so many diseases and sicknesses. So in other words, what I was trying to argue is that one of the big causes of diseases amongst the Aztecs was supernatural. And if you look and compare this to any part of the world, it was also supernatural here. Uh, the second thing is natural. We have natural causes of diseases amongst the Aztecs. One thing was smell, smells. Compare it with the miasmatic theory, the idea that smell spreads diseases. If you smell bad smells, then you could become sick. Well, maybe it's coincidence, but the Aztecs were laying siege uh, to uh, the a city state next to them, Culhuacan, and they threw worms, fish, ducks, and frogs into the fire. And then they, they spread, they pushed the smell into the city state. This caused the women, they said, to, be, uh, to abort their babies. People's limbs began to swell. They began to die. Uh, it probably had more to the fact that at this particular uh, um, uh, invasion of Kula Khan, they laid siege to this city for many, many weeks before they actually attacked, uh, which could have caused the death as well. But still, the smell could definitely be bad for your health because it is the product of some of these diseases. Skin diseases. Skin diseases are very common. Usually you get skin diseases because you have sins. So it's kind of associated with the supernatural. Uh, so you could go and you could confess to a priest of your sin. But oftentimes, and it's a little bit complex, but you would have to wear the flayed skin of a sacrificial victim uh, here. Uh, oftentimes, the priest would also wear this flayed uh, skin. A great story was told about the Aztec ruler that was to marry the princess of Acapulco. The princess's father came to uh, witness the feast, and they found the priest wearing her skin, which is the cause of them having to flee into the middle of the lake to begin with. This here is at the Library of Congress uh, on display. And um, this is a priest that would wear the skin of a sacrificial victim. Uh, for 20 days or until it started to fall off here. This was also one of the cures for skin diseases. And they did have many skin diseases, uh, uh, especially venereal disease uh, that uh, in not as frequent as, as later, but uh, frequently uh, decrees would be passed by the emperor uh, regarding venereal diseases. Uh, a theory has been that one of the diseases they had most was syphilis but there's no evidence that this is true uh, because the, uh, the uh, Spanish conquistadors came here, then they went and fought in Italy, and then they went over to France. And in Italy and France, they came down with syphilis. Did they get the syphilis from the American uh, uh, continent or was it coincidence? I'm not sure it's ever possible to find out. They did have venereal diseases, but no evidence of syphilis was in the Americas before the coming of the Europeans. Okay, so we know that they were, uh, had uh, smells caused bad breath, they had skin diseases, and they oftentimes had headaches. Uh, usually if you had a headache, it's because you had too much blood in your head. The best way then is to get rid of the blood. Uh, bloodletting in this case was by causing somebody to have a nosebleed. 
and there are lots of different herbal remedies in which you could have them sniff it that would cause them to sneeze and induce um, a nosebleed. Thankfully, when I sneeze, I don't have a nosebleed, but uh, you can imagine that uh, if you had uh, uh, this uh, headache and you had a, a fever, a temperature, that would be one option. It's kind of like the Middle Ages when we use bloodletting in Europe in order to balance out our four humors so it could be better, which kind of leads us to the balance of hot and cold. An excess of heat in the head or in the heart or in the eyes, that would cause diseases here. Uh, many uh, of the uh, later Europeans argued that the, the Aztecs died so fast because they had this process of taking hot baths, then cold baths. Um, I'm not sure that would cause you to uh, uh, get sick or die faster of smallpox, but it's an interesting thing to think about here. And again, you can compare this with the, the idea of humors that was spread so much by Hippocrates, Galen, and then uh, uh, became the common method of health concerns in Europe. All right, then. Uh, fever. Fever was often caused, as you can imagine, by internal heat. And so you could use a diuretic, a purgative, or some sort of similar cure to get rid of this in the Aztec Empire. So this would be through medicine. Medicine became very common in the Aztec Empire. But remember, the Aztecs didn't start coming down until 1110 CE. And so they're going to have to figure out what the people were already using. And then after the Spaniards came and they conquered the Aztecs, then they wanted to know what the Aztecs were using. Because oftentimes the Aztec uh, uh, physicians would be able to cure the Spanish uh, conquistadores. So that's what they would oftentimes attempt to, uh, to use their physicians on the Spaniards. Well, they have lots and lots of books about the herbal medicine uh, in, in, uh, uh, written down by the Spanish priests. Uh, the, when, one of the things that the Hernan Cortez and the Spaniards wrote most home about was the amazing zoo that's at Tenochtitlan and the amazing uh, botanical gardens. And amongst the other things they had the botanical gardens, they don't just have medicine, but uh, they would bring, it was established by the very first Moctezuma, uh, not the one that was encountered Cortez, but um, uh, by him, uh, and then he would, uh, when they conquered a territory, they would say, what cures for diseases do you have? And they would bring it over to the capital and then they would uh, plant them in the botanical garden and then begin to spread uh, this knowledge here, all sorts of, of plant cures. Uh, and you could find these written in all the, uh, the sources. Again, the sources that were written down by the Spaniards, Spaniards later. For example, you could take this particular plant, and I don't really know what the plant is, you know? Uh, that, well, you can see what the name of the plant is, but you could, you could solve dysentery, uh, help asthmatic breath, or this one here is a purgative, skin ailments, skin sores. Here's one for toothache, tonic for stomach. So they have all sorts of medicine in order to heal many of these diseases. Uh, here's an image of uh, this uh, person that is, uh, of course, collecting some of these plants to use. One of the things that allowed the uh, many of these Spaniards, I mean, and the Aztecs to, to uh, survive some of the wounds that killed this, the Spaniards is that they would uh, oftentimes uh, cauterize it by with boiling oil or they would wash it in fresh urine, which was uh, designed to clean it out here. And then they would wrap it up and they would keep it covered and allow it to, to to heal. Um, and this is one of the things that many of the Spaniards realized that it might be beneficial if they could use it as well. Okay, so so far I talked about, which I found interesting, and you guys at home are probably falling asleep on your keyboards, so it's going to ruin those and drooling on them. But uh, I found it interesting, the, the idea that it did have some of these, the Americas didn't have some of these big diseases but they did have diseases, but they also had these wonderful cures for the diseases, whether it be supernatural cures or natural cures, they're oftentimes mixed in together, right? Uh, one of the great theories that uh, I found weird when I was uh, a student was that they had so many protein deficiencies that they were forced to commit to uh, practice human sacrifice and cannibalize the corpses. 
Well, that's a great theory, but it's probably not true. They didn't have nutritional deficiencies. So therefore they're not going to uh, probably uh, catch many of these diseases before the coming of the Europeans. Now, once the Europeans came, uh, especially the, uh, the Hernan Cortez, they surrounded the Aztec capital, they cut off the freshwater aqueduct and they began to march the way into the center. So historically, uh, many argued that the ritual cannibalism was a result of insufficient protein-based diet. And this is from one of the, the Spaniards uh, drawing this. Um, and so most of the, the theories that are still being published come from say Bohr and Cook or Cook and Bohr uh, that argued that there's lots more calories consumed than we thought, but 100% of it came from corn, from maize. More recently, uh, even uh, as early as 1978, we're arguing that not as much came from corn. It came from beans, from meats, uh, from chia, from all sorts of different things here. Besides that, only about 25% of the population were noble people, and only noblemen, noble people could consume human flesh. Uh, I still remember my professor arguing uh, the, the similarities between the Christians partaking uh, flesh of their God and the Aztecs partaking flesh of their victims and saying, it doesn't seem that much worse. Well, it was to the Spaniards. So they grew a lot of food. They were able to feed themselves. They were nutritionally okay. In this case, they oftentimes uh, planted right on top of the the lake, that Lake Texcoco. They, they created a dam and the northern part was salty and then the southern part was fresh water. So they had to keep, that was one of the things that the, the, the Spaniards were quick to do is to break that dam between the north and the south to allow the salt water to come in and ruin a lot of their crops. But in this case, they plant the crops right on top of the water. And that's called the Chidampa or floating garden, hydroponics, it's uh, used today. And if you think about it, you have this, uh, this lake, and then you put a, a mat right on top of the mat, and then you you put the, wait, what did I just say? You have a lake, and then you put mat on top of the lake, and then you have to stake all four sides in so it doesn't float away, and then on top of it, you put a whole bunch of stuff uh, here, such as uh, dirt and human excrement. That was a good way. They would, oftentimes, they would uh, unlike many of the Europeans at the same time would dump it into the streets, they dump the chamber pots. Here they would have excrement collectors that would come and they would collect it and then they would use them here. Uh, and then they would also collect the, the urine and they would sell those for, for tanning and for different purposes there. And in this case, they planted right on here uh, and then the, they plant the maize in here and then the roots go all the way down to the, to the, the 10, 15, 20 feet down until they finally uh, take hold of something, whether it's another root or something, and then you can plant three or four or as many, they are with seven uh, harvests in a single year. You could plant a lot of food. You could feed a lot of people with these chinampas. Uh, and again, this is an image from, uh, I think this is the Florentine Codex. It's one of these many codexes done by the Europeans as they came here. So uh, a great uh, historian that studies the health amongst the Aztecs, finished a lecture like this one with the following quote. Uh, Although my focus has uh, focused so far has been on remedies uh, for disease, we should remember that health involves much more than curing disease after it occurs. Preventing disease and illness is as or more important than curing disease. Maintaining health involves eating a healthy and varied diet. The Aztecs ate a high fiber, low cholesterol and very varied, uh, varied diet practically anything that flew, crawled, or swam. Uh, exercise, there were no beasts of burden or wheels. Humans had to carry everything. And public health measures, the Aztecs had provisions for clean water, those aqueducts. The aqueduct, oh, anyway, and floating honey wagons, right? The aqueducts uh, were, were made so that you could have fresh water uh, always, so that you could clean an aqueduct while still flowing water just like um, there's some in uh, France as well from the Roman Empire that you could move back and forth. So you could always have clean water. There was in the, uh, under uh, Moctezuma the first and then even Moctezuma the second, there's periods of drought that will occur. 
they had enough food that they were able to feed the populace. Although it is true that many of the populace said, well, I think I'll move out to the countryside uh, in the 1480s and 1490s. And they did move out to the countryside, but then they came back as soon as they could into the city of Tenochtitlan. So a conclusion, uh, I don't really have a great conclusion, really, I don't. Uh, I find it uh, fascinating that they, they, we still call it virgin territory, but I think it's kind of a, a weird name, virgin territory, because they had diseases and they had sicknesses, but they also had ways to cure the diseases and cure the sicknesses. These ginormous ones, like the bubonic plague, that's true, they did not have. That's a, probably a good thing. That doesn't sound like fun at all. Here, uh, of course, no sicknesses does sound like fun. Uh, so they didn't really have as much. We do know, though, that uh, for about 100 million people by the 17th century, that Depression three, when the economy of the world had gone south, they only had 5 million. And from then, they began to increase. And today, uh, demographic historians argue, and their numbers get a little confusing, there are more indigenous personnel in uh, Mesoamerica than there ever were in the history of, uh, of uh, Latin America. And that concludes my discussion.